first step of every vintage is cutting off most of what happened last year so that we are pruning away what came before in planning for the future. The vine tells us what it needs to do for the next year, and we get to coax it to the place we want it to be. Wine is, for me, this intersection of so many things that I'm interested in. It has a tremendous history. There's uh, a significant amount of science and chemistry, biology, that's interactive, that every year is not a new experiment, but every lesson from the years past gets poured into the next vintage to try and understand how to make the best out of that vintage. It's that perfect marriage of art and science. You just spend all your time just crafting it putting it together and then you just set it free into the world. We really get one chance a year to make that wine from that place as a unique object and every year has its own challenges. Most winemakers are control freaks. We want things to be done a certain way. Nature doesn't really follow those rules. From the first time you prune to the first time you're going out there and seeing the little bud, you know, the process is gonna react to that year's mother nature. We tend to have very strong relationships with her because there's only so much that you can do with man-made inputs. She's gonna do whatever she wants and you just have to learn to go with the flow. It's a very peaceful relationship. I think acceptance is important. If you're given what you're given, make the best of it. When you learn to just let other nature take its course and stress less, I find that my wines tend to be a lot better because I'm really owning that vintage for what it actually is. So we try to do as much as we can and then you just kind of shoot up the prayer and, and hope for the best at some points. I think I do a lot of rain dances, sun dances occasionally. Do your rain dances, you know, <laughs> whatever you need to do. You're still farming and, you know, that is by definition going to be crapshoot. That's the way it goes. It's a partnership, but in the end, Mother Nature really has the final say. If you're a cereal producer, you can usually go back to the market and find grain from another location and still produce you know, your Wheaties or whatever it is you're doing. Wine is from somewhere. And so if I lose the fruit out of a vineyard, it's gone. And we have issues like frost. Drive the vineyard in 2008, we lost 90% of the crop. One shot, frost, gone. It's like getting a terrible childhood disease where there's no coming back from it. New plantings, you get frost at the wrong time, well, you're putting new plants in the ground the next year because they're dead, literally. Done. Uh, try again next year. Mm -hmm. 
when to pick is really the most important decision any winemaker makes in any year, that day. That's the decision you can't unmake. One of the great business plans is to make white wine <laughs> because you get to pick white grapes before pressure uh, comes along. But with red wine grapes, you need this maturity that comes with time, and that means you're hanging that fruit out at the end of a season, and something can come along. It's not often that we have seasons that we, we're not forced by heat or rain to pick either a little bit before or a little bit after when we really want the fruit to come in. In general, you kind of find yourself doing this, this dance with Mother Nature and really trying to figure out, in some vineyards, if you can get the grapes as ripe as possible before something comes in. Those first few years, if I look back on it now and tape recorded myself, I'd probably be slapping myself. <laughs> <laughs> there were a number of phone calls about rain and, and all sorts of things. And my partner, lovely wife, uh, said to me, you can't do anything about it. Just roll with it. Even though so much of what a wine is is driven by things that are in part outside of my control, what's grown, how it's grown, where it's grown, who's growing it, and the environment of the year it grew in. Uh, particularly, I, that's beyond my control. In 2010, you had a factor which was a very hot spell. And in 2011, you had rain. So what does a winemaker do when those things happen? 11 specifically got a bad rap because a lot of people did panic. And yeah. they picked it green. Yeah. And they weren't ready. Right. And, and they, they couldn't, you know, there's no way to fix that, right? I left my Zinfandel on the vine, and I let it go through two storms. Uh, my dad was not thrilled with me at all. And if you embraced Mother Nature and you let Mother Nature kind of do its thing, it worked, and it worked phenomenally well. Seeing the great winemakers, they really shine in those vintages. I'll use every tool, every technique, every idea to help push the wine to the best that it could possibly be under those circumstances. So being flexible and, and understanding what your options are at all times and how to best achieve your goals in, it with an, in an ever-changing environment, that really is you know, the issue of being a winemaker. You have to embrace why a vintage is important. The same brand from the 2011 vintage to the 2013, they're going to be different wines. They're, they're going to be different flavor profiles. Every year is different. That's what blows me away, is like every single year is different. It's definitely what keeps this job fresh, is that no one year is the same. One year might compare very similar to another year, but it right. might be like five years ago. I remember hearing people talk about how the vintages in, different, in Napa don't matter. Like, are you crazy? Maybe they're not as dramatic as they are in Burgundy or Bordeaux, where you have these disastrous rains. But we have cold seasons, we have hot seasons, we have rains. So even though it's the same winemaker, the same vineyard, the same grower, the changes in vintage show different faces of wine. If everything was a commodity in the wine industry, that would be really simple. I'd just say that, you know, red wines have this character and, and a Cabernet always tastes like this and a Chardonnay always tastes like that. But that's not what it's about. It's about the region they're from and what makes those regions so special. have this view of what a winemaker does and he's out in the vineyard and he's tasting his barrels and he's looking at that and I may not taste barrels for a week or two because I'm too worried about when the next shipment of barrels is coming and is my glass coming on time and do I have a bottling truck in it on time and the labor for harvest or any number of other things so we are running a five ring circus driven by many factors beyond our control. One of the other winemakers who lives not far from us, said before he puts, he calls this the cap and gown 
the cap and the top being the gown. Yeah. He's made a thousand decisions yeah. that affect that bottle of wine. I don't know if the number's right, but it's the idea how complicated it really is. I started working with Ron. His property is really a small vineyard, like a southwest facing solar panel on Howell Mountain, classic Howell Mountain, red volcanic soils, sitting on top of a rock cap, so in a few places it's only 18 inches of, of topsoil. It really is a site that does a very specific thing every year. Yes, there are some variations in the wine, but it, you always know that it is from there. It has a voice and it sings. It's late spring, about a month after bud break. And so we're getting into this grand period of growth. That shoot was half, its, half that size two days ago. The flowers still have yet to set to turn into berries. We're sitting at this time of year. You've got six months of decisions to make. And then it's two years in your barrel. Absolutely. With more decisions to make. And another year in the bottle with more decisions <laughs> to make. Exactly. Every choice you make has a cascade of effects. Absolutely. That affect you three years later or four years later because you're affecting buds the following year in the vineyard. And we're one of the few industries that actually take the raw product of planting it in the soil, nurturing it up for three or four years to become a vineyard. Then we get a season, a year of Mother Nature to coax this vintage to the very best that we can. And then we bottle this creation that we've been working on for five years, and then we have to try to sell it to start the cycle all over again. And so the relationship of the person who hopefully is opening up that bottle is really wired back to us. It is that direct connection back to a place and a time and to people who are involved in it. We're about to come through and remove extra shoots from the vineyard, selecting which shoots we're going to leave. So we see in this little short shoot here that there are two clusters that will potentially become berries down the road. During that period of flowering, if we have really bad weather, those flowers will fail to turn into grapes. If we had a frost that could destroy the whole vineyard. I admit to being totally neurotic during the flowering for <laughs> two weeks. For me, the best part of this whole project has been understanding the role of Mother Nature. Absolutely. And she's the boss, and she wins, and you have to take hold of that and interpret it for us. You can't control it. No. Nope. So we're, once again, we're subject to the whims of Mother Nature. And as, uh, as, a, as a friend of mine said, sometimes nature is just a mother. <laughs> <laughs> End quote. End quote, yeah. <laughs> This is a first look at a, at a 13, a state Cabernet from up here on Howell Mountain, which was a very fun vintage. Howell at the moon, Howell Mountain, the Knoll Vineyard, Napa Valley, Cabernet Sauvignon 2013. There's a lot of the new wood character, so great sort of spice components, um, red fruit, cassis, some really nice blackberry bramble characters underneath. Beautiful tannins, rich structure. Um, in the nose, it's beautiful tobacco leaf, cassis. How Mountain's kind of famous for the type of tannin, that inky color. There's also this, like, hot rock notion. You can really sit down and you can smell a glass, and, you know, there's this Rutherford dust concept. Um, I feel the same, you know, in Howe Mountain, that there's, there's this different type of dust that's up there. I call it moon dust and it's really, really quite interesting. When you're working on Howe Mountain, there's like this stony minerality that comes through. It's really complementary to big reds. And it appears in my Zinfandel, it appears here in this Cabernet. Part of the story is seeing that there was actually somebody who did this. There was a person behind that bottle of wine on the shelf. Someone whose livelihood, whose training, is to make that thing. We often forget that it's that it's not a, necessarily an industrial product. It's a it's a crafted thing that someone has poured their intention into. Silly me, but it never occurred to me that 
that was an option. I could do that thing. And so I'm a consulting winemaker. I help many small brands and some larger ones with their projects. I have a set of skills. I understand the business aspects of wine. I'm predominantly a scientist and a biologist and a blender. I, I understand how to grow the grapes, how to assemble the wines, how to, how to, how to manage that. I understand how the pieces go together to make the wine that my clients are interested in. I don't own any vineyards. I don't own a winery. I work at other people's wineries, or I'm still among them. And that's what you get with consulting. I mean, you get to be able to you know, work with different you know, owners, creating you know, perhaps different styles that they want or different blends or whatnot. But most importantly, you get to work with farming in different areas of the valley, which is very cool. We're at Hidden Ridge Vineyard, high in the Mayacamas Mountains between Napa and Sonoma on the Sonoma County side. Uh, it's the end of spring. We've just completed the grand period of growth, so the canopy is about as tall as it's going to get in the growing season. The flowers are setting to berries. We still have some canopy management to do for guiding sunlight into those clusters as they develop and ripen. What makes this spot unique is both the extreme topography, the terraced hillsides where the vines are planted, but also, as you can see right now, this breeze coming in from the Petaluma Gap from the Bodega Bay that moderates the climate here, provides for good warm days, but every afternoon we start to cool off, preserves natural acidity and fruit flavors that make this a truly unique site. When you're up on a hillside and you have thinner soils and you have more extremes. This is very volcanic soil up here. This is very rocky. It's going to create wines with a more significant personality. They're not the easiest grapes to grow in the world. They all look like they're struggling and they've got some attitude. Yeah. Um, they're a little pissed. Places that where well, the vine has some struggle to give usually give wines of some distinction. That chiseled hillside expression, uh, it's very bold, it's very dark, it's very intricate and capable of finesse at the same time. Napa and Sonoma are divided by the Mayacamas Range. It starts with Mount Beter and then goes on to Spring Mountain and Diamond Mountain at the north end. Those mountains are important. And I think the people that live in those mountains are important. It's actually one of the, the last holdouts of the pirates and the poets on the hill. There are a bunch of crazy people up on Mount Beter. It really is a last refuge of the radical hippies. We could call one side of the mountains there Napa Valley and one side Sonoma. But if you're living up in those mountains and you're farming up in those mountains, you're connected to everybody on both sides. The wines that are made on the Mayacamas range, I think, are more of a family into itself than it is specific to Napa or Sonoma. California legend was that California is such a great place to grow grapes that the terroir didn't make any difference. What defines Napa as a great grape growing region is its proximity to the San Francisco Bay, which you can see behind me. That cold body of water keeps the summers moderate, keeps the nights cool. We might be 10 degrees cooler on the ridgeline than, than it is on the valley floor, which gives a unique character to the, the grapes at this site. There's a concept we have in winemaking called terroir uh, about the uniqueness of place and how the earth gives a character to its wine. And from a winemaker's perspective, or at least from mine, it's not just the earth, it's the climate, it's the place that those grapes grew in, how that vine interprets its location and gives its unique qualities to the wine that comes from it. It's the combination of factors that make a place, right? So it's geography, geology, climate. It's the interaction of the variety and the rootstock with its environment that 
translate into the characteristics of the grapes. I grow Pinot in two different locations and it comes out different even though the vine is theoretically the same. When we started this, most of the vineyards in Napa were planted on AXR. Absolutely. And AXR was a crazy rootstock and didn't seem to make much difference what the terroir was. Then when the AXR was wiped out by phylloxera, all of a sudden we learned, oh my goodness, the terroir makes a tremendous difference. An enormous amount of difference. We have named vineyards within Napa Valley, within Sonoma County, that are great for Pinot Noir, they're great for Cabernet Sauvignon, and I think we're continuing to refine that so that terroir does make an enormous amount of difference. And I really believe, based on what I've seen in the changes in viticulture, in the wine business, and in winemaking, that yes, style has evolved because of consumer taste and some of the scoring some, but the change with AXR and then the change of how we manage canopies were the fundamental drivers in that difference. And it just so happened that the, the most powerful sort of critics liked the style of wine that came from that. I think this evolution is a good thing and I think the differences between Sonoma, Napa and all other parts of California will continue to define themselves. I believe that Napa Valley, in its diversity of microclimates, soils, so on and so forth, there is so much diversity in the terroir. My dark matter and my aloft come from two separate parcels. They're not even a mile from each other, and the wines couldn't be more uniquely different. There's a certain structure and a certain textural kind of perception on wines from specific Appalachians. I think every AVA or Appalachian has its own signature, their own print on um, attributes of smell, taste, and texture. A difference in ripeness, a difference in acidity, a difference in soil. You've got Stag's Leap often being referred to as this iron fist in a velvet glove, where it's just these silky tannins. There's a there there to the fruit in Stag's Leap, the sort of softer tannins, the kind of black fruit that people can recognize very readily. Stag's Leap District was one of the first AVAs that really made an impact on the international scene, so I think it has a historical importance. And then you might have something like Mount Vider or Spring Mountain or Howl Mountain that just has these intense mountain tannins and this really robust structure with a different kind of fruit pattern. Even slightly romantic approach to terroir, that the people that make this place are part of the terroir in some ways. The year and the people that make it. Years ago, when we were pushing ripeness levels to an all-time high level, we were maybe dissipating that concept of terroir. But today, we're kind of pulling back and maybe reconnecting with that. You know, for me as a sommelier, having that sense of place is a big deal. I want to know about this uh, vineyard, and I want to tell a story about that vineyard. Each individual location has its own story that we try to capture in a bottle. I love the sense of terroir. I love when you can taste the soil, taste the dirt. I've watched my grandfather do it for years, where you, know, you take the dirt and you taste the dirt. And you see if you can see that actually within the wine. And that's what's so amazing about the Napa Valley is the the difference in sites from Valley Floor to Howl Mountain to Spring Mountain to Oakville specifically. It's great when you can taste the wine and say, wow, that came from Rutherford, or hey, that came from Atlas Peak or Diamond Mountain. For us here, it's to tell the story of this little place in Stag's Leap as truthfully as we can. And I think every decision that I make, I try to honor that idea. You're really looking for that unique voice from that place. What does that place have to offer the grapes that are grown there? And find that and emphasize that particular characteristic. It's got just this beautiful fragrance of sweet, sweet spice. Candied fruit, um, I get uh, spice notes, and actually a very, very pretty cherry. In some ways, this is a truly classic wine, more in the Mayakama style than in the modern Rubuso style. And it's got your signature in it. You always find this very deep fruit in every vintage we make. What I've done is increase the concentration of those, of those flavors, mostly through farming, and then some through when I pick and how we manage the wines. There is a tendency in certain parts of the world to make wines that are so overblown that 
they're sexy and they're lovely, but there's no sense of where it comes from. But this land requires the kind of style that I think that you're, you're expressing with it. The flavors that we're dealing with are not ones that I'm bringing to the wine. They're from the place. I really do think that this wine could only come from here. That's real. I meet people sometimes who think that we're just making it up when we say that. Sometimes people think it's just marketing spin. It's like, no, no any agricultural or horticultural product that you put a lot of care into, like coffee or chocolate, is going to have incredible sense of place. The problem on this estate is anything, it's like the, the terroirs are so many. Absolutely. Rubiceau is an incredibly complicated property. There's quite a bit of diversity in aspect and soil, soil depth, the same uplifted ancient seabed that are in Carneros and are different from other parts of Mount Vitor. Other parts of Mount Vitor have this, have this soil type, but Mount Vitor is a mix of these ancient seabeds and volcanic uplift that form the mountain. Actually, after years of working there, I think of our spot as being a very warm Carneros vineyard, mountain vineyard. Because of the cooling winds off of the San Pablo Bay, part of the San Francisco Bay, it's much cooler than neighboring vineyards that are protected from that breeze. Quite a bit cooler even than the town of Napa, not very far, five minutes away. The land gives you what's possible from the place. Certainly, I leave that stylistic handprint on the, on the wines, but wine is one of, is a, one of the few exceptions where you can trace its origin back to the location that it's from, that it's about somewhere, and that it says about something about the place that it's from at its best. Some wine is just wine to have today and not think much more about it than it tastes good with dinner, and that's all. And really, that's really wine's main function is to is to brighten your life and to have I feel that way. to enjoy. Let's wines, not take it too serious. But some wines do rise to the level of art where you want to appreciate the thing for its craftsmanship, its, its, its sense of place, its origin. It has a story to tell. Even if you don't know the history of the thing, that just in tasting it, it brings something extra to the something experience. Good. For the original 150 years, uh, we were trying to make French wine, or we were trying to be inspired by the classics. Wine is part of the way of living in France. And thanks to the Appalachian system and to the history, now in France, we have very big wines, very prestigious wines that we kept the traditional way of making them and that maybe will talk a story to the people when they will drink it. But once we got connected or comfortable in our own skin, so to speak, we really started making true expressions of, of California and of Napa, Sonoma, Russian River, but uh, those differences are starting to matter. I have been accused of making Bordeaux-like wines from this property. <laughs> I'm happy and, to hear that, right? And, and, um, I wonder why. <laughs> I believe that uh, Sonoma and Napa are influencing the rest of the world, maybe more so than the rest of the world is influencing Sonoma and Napa at this point in time. So in choosing a place for two um, Francophiles, for two Enophiles who, with great love for Bordeaux, you chose the perfect property to make that style of wine. Beautiful. <laughs> Those are, that is the kind of wine that this place makes. If they taste like that, that's because that's the way they taste, not because I'm trying to make them that way. It's changed so much. I often say that, that when we first put this in the bottle, um, it was very closed aromatically. There was intensity, but not a lot of fruit flavor. Now it's perfumed. It's drinking nice. This is really lovely. I mean, it's still, it's still really young, but it's incredibly supple. It has that little spicy note that comes off the Hell Mountain mm -hmm. vineyard. Balance, good fine grain tannin. You know, you can feel the tannin still because of the youth, but. And the nose, it's beautiful tobacco leaf, cassis, red raspberry, fresh cigar box black currant, red currant, you know, all the beautiful flavors that you would expect and smell um, in, in a Cabernet Sauvignon. Swirling the wine is really to get air into the wine and make it smell like something. You really want to smell what the wine, you know, to, to get what the wine smells like. Put your hand over the top, swirl it around, and take a big whiff. After that, smell and taste. If you swish the wine around in your mouth, again, you're gonna get more air into it, you're gonna get it across more taste buds. And really the other big trick, and this is a kind of a learned skill, is to slurp. So you go like this, you... <laughs> 
most of our sense of taste is really our nose. And so slurping, bringing air through the wine and pushing it back out makes the wine explode in terms of flavor. You don't have to do that every time, but to get the most out of the experience, that's what you do. Got a nice nose. It's got tart fruit. Just the right amount of earth flavor coming after yeah, it. A little cocoa on that. Kind of has that whole Ebenezer Scrooge nose. Some cherry in there, too. Chocolate and coffee and Grassy. Rum. Really sweet. Tart finish. Fruity as I think the expression mm -hmm. would be. It smells like wine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. It's OK, right? That'd I mean, really it's like you're day. supposed to enjoy the wine Some the way you enjoy it. Strong. We often get caught up in a particular nomenclature so that the wine's minerality and the acidity and its sweat stone and all of that, which is often what the experience is that a wine drinker is saying, I, I think it tastes like wet rocks. It doesn't taste like wet rocks, but the smell of the rain on a gravel driveway has a smell to it. And if you smell that in wine, that's what we're talking about. For somebody with a Davis background, we all took Ann Noble's class who told us we need to come to an agreement on what this language means. So that we're, when we say blackberry, we know what blackberry means, right? Needless to say, that language will not become the measure by which people describe wine. People are going to get creative. The sense of smell is tied directly into our emotions and, um, and into, our, into our memories. They're going to talk about their grandmother's pantry and they're going to talk about Oh, Christmas at, you know, Uncle Joe's or whatever references they have. It evokes those things. We smell in wine, you smell blackberry, you smell, um, I mean, I get that sort of uh, uh, sugar cookie, clove. My grandfather had a taste descriptor called Foxy. Where the heck that terminology came from, I have no idea. That the wine was a little bit more tannic and that it was cloying and kind of Almost like you have sandpaper on the front of your teeth and your lips kind of sticking to it. All of those things are real, but if you're a novice and you know nothing about wine, you say, this smells like wet latex paint on the inside of a bicycle tire. If it really does smell like and that I say to you, good, good then, then that's what it smells like to you, not this wine. I have smelled those, both of those things <laughs> in wine. You need to follow your intuition first and listen to your gut before listening to what everyone else says. You sip it, and instead of looking at the other person for validation, you just say, mm, oh, yeah, strong blackberry leaf. All it is is a statement. It doesn't mean you're a snob or anything. It just means that you, this particular human smells blackberry leaf. So if you taste chocolate or saddle or your ex-boyfriend's dirty socks, that's the thing that's there. So don't worry about ever using, using the language that best describes the wine to you, if that's the right language. The last major developmental change is verasion. It's when the, the grapes go from hard green berries to colored, flavorful berries. It's the point in time when the bunches have closed in, the berries have sized up, cell division stops, but cell enlargement continues and cell softening happens. So, we see color, flavor, all the changes leading into ripeness. The seeds are ripe enough for the plants to grow and be spread, so the vine is now deciding to make the fruit around them attractive, be scattered about by birds, by animals, by people. And it's that attractive characters, the flavors, the intensity, the sugars that we're after as winemakers. Very end of a region, we cut off those clusters that are developmentally behind, because they'll be adding unripe flavors to what is mostly a ripe, a ripe vineyard. We typically drop between two and five percent of the crop at that final green thinning. I never understood that there's a deadline where if it isn't turned purple, you know, it's not going to ripen because there's an end date where it's going to get picked. Exactly. Because of the weather. Again, here comes Mother Nature into the decision. Not all vineyards require it. Um, and I think that there's some vineyards have a, a natural balance. Um, in some vineyards, you have to just work a little bit harder, and that's where that dropping fruit really comes into play. Almost every year, this comes down to a battle of the vineyard team versus the winemaker team, although as the owner, I don't want it to be a versus situation, but it ends up being that. Well, that's one of the biggest battles we have is that it's the, the fruit that you see on the ground, but it's not the fruit on the ground that matters, it's the fruit that's left on the vine. vineyard team will always want the crop to be as huge as possible because that's a sign of abundance and you know look we did a great job 
And I think the wine side is always trying to tamp that down. There's a cost for quality, right? And who do you want to be is the first question any, any winemaker wants to ask. We're trying to make beautiful expression of this site. And the only way to do that is through restricting the yield and managing the canopy. So it's this balance every year. Whatever it takes to put something great in the bottle is what we do here. And you know when your vine can't handle a larger crop load given what the conditions were for that year. And it's just part of what has to be done. What we'll do is we'll aggressively drop fruit um, prior to veraison um, because this pro crop will actually overload itself. So I'm out there cutting fruit off and crying and Weeping. cutting more fruit off and crying but understanding at the end that that's what lets you love what's in that bottle. Yep, there's definitely going to be stuff that we're going to be cutting off beforehand like this. I don't like it when it's all raisins. It's not painful. It's, you know, it's it's just active decision making and necessary. Um, for my grandfather it was. Uh, he used to make us go behind and pick up all the fruit and then we'd have to crush it. Um, and it was, it, that was painful. At the end of the day, if it makes, you know, better quality wine, I'll sacrifice a little. I posted it the first year we did it and called it Owner's Lament <laughs> on Facebook because there's beautiful <laughs> clusters on the ground and you realize what's left is what, again, you're affecting the decision to put behind that label. There is a vibrancy that happens during harvest. It really, there's a period of time, it's about three months long, when the fruit comes in. It really is the most exciting time of the year for, for me. And this adrenaline rush that you get. It's a frenzy. It's uh, the time of year that we anticipate the most because we are going forward into the next vintage. Can't wait for fruit to come, and yet at the same time we dread it because there's so much riding on it for the next year. Often my easiest time of year is what most people consider the hardest. It's harvest. It's what we like to joke, our slow season. I have one job to make the best wine 100 times in a row for three months. That's what I do. You have this nine month build up every single year. And to get to that, that end goal, which essentially isn't the end goal, but just the beginning of bringing the fruit in is really kind of what it's all about. I think those few weeks leading up to harvest, that time um, is to me the most special. Everything up to that point you do before you make your picking decision is in trying to make the grapes as ready as possible to make the wines that you hope to make out of those certain blocks. Once the decision is made to plant a variety and it's to go rootstock on a site, what drives style from that vineyard is how it's grown and when it's picked. Style really is impacted by the winemaker's decision on um, things that will affect the aesthetics of that wine, right? When to pick. Are you a riper picker or a less riper picker? I might pick two weeks later in a vineyard than another winemaker. The wine that I make will be different. It will still tell you something about the place that it's from, how it was grown, how it was managed, but the flavor profile will change. So from raspberry to blackberry to blueberry to prune, I'm so happy that I'm not here all the time during a harvest, and you probably are too, because implicitly, when you get to the end of the harvest period and you start tasting the grapes, you know, they taste quite ripe. Well, you know, those are good. The rain is coming. I said, come on, Tim, go and pick them. And you're always saying, no, 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 you got to wait another couple of weeks or so. There's a whole group of, kind of new winemakers, new as of the last 30 years, that pick just by taste. When I taste a specific thing, I know how many days it's going to take if the, obviously, Mother Nature coincides with what I'm wanting. We make our picking decisions based on, on walking the blocks, tasting the fruit. And when it tastes right for what my goal is, the wine at the end, that's when I decide to pick. I think that's my favorite thing on the planet, is walking vineyards, tasting fruit, getting close to that moment when you know the fruit's optimal. We're looking for the specific depth of character beyond the sweetness. So there's a spiciness, there's a richness. I'm looking at dimpling, um, which is a huge thing. 
And for me, this is my indication that I'm almost ready to pick, as well as I'm tasting the flavors. Um, I'll receive bricks later today. Last week, the bricks were at 25 wine. Um, with the heat, I'm assuming that this will probably put me at 26. In many cases, some wineries will pick entirely based on chemistry when, the, when there's a certain amount of sugar in the grapes. If it was a high degree of sugar, you just picked it then, and it was like you already hit your, your numbers, just pick it. Dad, back in the 80s and 90s, he would walk through this vineyard, and uh, we would do detailed chemical analysis on all this. And working with you with your own method, which I feel is just as technical, but the technical aspect is built into the sort of intuitive aspect. All those different factors kind of play in, and over the years, I've I focus less on the science and use it as, as a reference, um, but really go more on my intuition now. The chemistry is a pretty blunt instrument in terms of trying to understand what's happening at harvest time. And there are things it tells you, but it, the things that you can tell by taste are more, both the same things and in addition. Past a certain point in harvest, numbers don't really mean anything. We definitely look at numbers, but my decision to pick is really, um, it's based on, on taste. When it's, we get close to harvest every single day, taste, 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 making sure the chemistry is right, but it's still the flavor. We definitely start evaluating solely based on taste and flavors. Solely on taste for me, yep. So when you're picking based on flavor, not on chemistry, you have to taste a lot of fruit. After you taste enough grapes, you can tell when they're perfectly ripe. There is a light bulb that goes off. Um, the acidity is just speaking the right way to me in my mouth. The texture and the tannins are speaking to me. What I want specifically, I want bright flavors. For me, when I walk through the vineyards, I'm tasting the grapes and I'm looking for, you know, those dark fruits, those black cherries. Current is something I'm really after. And then obviously, and going back to the winery and looking at the numbers and, and seeing where the bricks level's at. The fruit is sweet enough. It's been, it's been developing. It's enough bricks. It's around 25, 26 bricks, enough to make wine. But the question is, how's it taste? Flavors are edging into blackberry, uh, sort of nice ripe flavors. The tannins are still a little bit edgy. I try to get it before it tastes raisiny. Um, and it, there's like a fine line. It's about the freshness of the fruit. To me, I really like to pick fruit when it still has some fruit integrity. So I don't like, you know, I don't like raisins. Not too many anyway. A little bit is good for complexity, but not too much. I remember as a kid, I was an A's fan. I used to chew on my um, baseball glove. I remember that leather tanniny taste. When the grapes are just past ripe, they start to taste like that. We want them on the fresher side of ripeness. I'm by no means am I looking for an over ripeness. I, mean, I, don't, I don't go after that pruny character because I do want the acidity and the grapes to c come forth as well. There's a juiciness to it. There's a floral aspect and then there's a lot of pepper in, in it, which is totally crazy to think that you can taste all that in a grape, but it really expresses itself when it becomes wine as well. And then that usually that plum characteristic is always present right when I'm about to pit. And it has to be very releasable in the skins. And you can actually, with your own eyes, you can see and feel the color, the anthocyanins that are in the grape skins. And I'm looking to see the color extract. So that's a good indication I'm going to have a good color here. And if those are giving and the flavors are there and, you know, the seeds are matured, which is another critical part. Color of the seeds is where you find full um, maturity of a grape. Those seeds get brown and you look at it and you just know. Brown seeds, I'm looking for a little less of the pulp sticking to it. Another indicator of ripeness is just the tish, how the tissues are evolving, the still gelatin coat the, around the seeds. And as the seeds ripen, they change color. How did we get all those ones that tasted like stewed vegetables? It's because the interior of that grape was not developed enough. Those seeds have to mature to a sort of a nutty crunchiness versus a green, harsh tannin. Hitting this kind of balance point where you're at this full ripeness where you can really kind of chew down on the skins and the seeds and not be left with anything green or bitter, and then trying to translate that through into the finished wines. When all of those three factors fall into place, healthy fruit, the release of color, and the ripeness of the fruit and the seeds itself is when I decide to pick. Nice and nutty. Really good. 
almost there, about a week away. That decision is the most difficult one that I make. The one that I lose sleep over more than anything else is, is it time? Could I have gotten another day or did I go too, you know, you're trying to go as far as you can without going too far. You're most connected to the ground at that point and, you know, the decision that you're about to make will impact um, what you're gonna have in the bottle. The great winemaker, wine grower dichotomy comes up immediately at that point because it's, well, we really don't want to take up that little piece of land and pick it in 10 picks. No. But if it's over here, can't you do it in two? Right, exactly. No. No, what? no. We can't just pick in broad swaths. We pick in these little micro batches. This kind of vineyard is, I mean, it's part of our soul. We connect with this land in a very personal way to get a sense of where the ripeness starts, the slower ripening section. Do you see the differences as you walk through a vineyard from one side to the other or variations in the topography? What I taste in the vineyard translates into the wine at the end. It really is fundamentally the flavor of the grapes that translates, that transforms into, into the wine. If the grapes don't taste good, the wine won't, right? So the limit of quality of any wine is the fruit that it comes from. And so wine is a shadow of the vineyard. been mostly warm, uh, one of the better years we've had in, in, in quite a few. So we've got a little more dehydration than we might normally have. That's because this is such a dry location. And that's what makes our wines so distinctive in terms of the intensity of flavors and aromas, because these skins are so thick. They're packed with flavor and aromatic chemicals. We've got great tannins, great color. Um, the flavors are really, really popped, you know, that perfect ripe tomato, that perfect ripe apple, that perfect ripe cherry, well, it's the perfect ripe grape. Grapes for wine are sometimes a little wrinkly. They're not the most beautiful thing, but they taste beautiful, and that's what we're after. Most winemakers have this experience during harvest that we're walking through the vineyard, tasting fruit and thinking, ah, do I, have I forgotten what ripe fruit tastes like? Have I forgotten what it's like? It's, it's, this doesn't seem right to me, but it's been, you know, the timing, things look about right. And then two days later, the fruit changes. Oh, of course, that's what I'm waiting for. Now we're there, now it's time to pick. It's good, it's really <laughs> good. Really good. We've had great weather for the last two weeks. We've been able to hang it as long as we wanted. You can see the canopy starting to turn yellow. It's fall, it's really started to come on to us and it's time to bring the grapes in. Ramon, what do you think? Are they ready? Ready to go. It's harvest, I've decided to pick. So I call the vineyard manager, get me a crew or two crews, we can get so many tons off that day, it'll be delivered to the winery by 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or 1 p.m. Um, you know, the point rows at the north end of H that we're gonna leave for later, let's take those now. That's the perfect life of a winemaker. I'm standing in one vineyard, talking to a vineyard manager about another pick that's going on. That's, this happens again and again. We pick most of our vineyards, because many of them are hillside vineyards you can't run machines through by hand. A man can pick about a ton of fruit in about six hours, depending on the vineyard. It's the hardest work that you could possibly imagine. I've done it, it's, it's a beast. They do it fast and they do it clean. I have great respect for the people who do, who do that work. Once you've made that picking decision, there's really not a whole lot that you can add to it, but there's a whole lot that you can lose from not treating the fruit properly. There's always a bunch of leaf matter in the picks, so we try to get as much of that out as early as we can, because as soon as these dry leaves go through the destemmer, they just get <laughs> obliterated into a million little pieces. Uh, and then everything else does, we'll still put that through the sorting table, but 
uh, as much as we can do now is probably helpful. bring the fruit and you really want to see that it's given all the attention that you can give it. So we take every care to make sure that we destem it and handle the fruit properly and get it into tankers as softly as possible. I use what's called custom crush wineries, so I don't have my own winery where I bring fruit to. I bring fruit to a winery whose business it is to crush my wine or someone else's wine, that sort of thing. So I would arrive at the winery with the fruit and the fruit gets processed. So we have forklifts to pick them up and dump them out, and lay the fruit out. And there's people who are picking out the any extra leaves that might have gotten through. You can see the ladies and Tim sorting right there and, and the, the berries just sort of travel along that table. Um, anything that's smaller than the grapes in the bottom of the table falls through as waste. Um, anything that's blown off in, in, from the air knife that we have at the very end of the table also uh, gets thrown into a waste bin. In the wine business, they call it mo of material other than grapes. Snakes, beer cans, all kinds of fun stuff. The then perfect looking little blueberries fall down into the, uh, the sump and the, and the auger right there and get pumped through up into a tank. We become almost obsessive in all the little minutia of details that can influence or the way we distem it, the way we handle the fruit coming in, temperatures, the fermentation process. If it's white wine, it gets thrown direct to press. So the whole clusters get dumped into a press. And it's a great big machine with a balloon inside that presses against the grapes and squeezes the juice out. Simple as that. That gets run down to a tank, maybe to barrels, and fermented and becomes white wine. So we brought in some Pinot Gris grapes this morning from Oak Knoll District. And we're using a technique called whole cluster fermentation. So what we've got the intern team doing here is uh, they're foot stomping the grapes meaning we're going to leave all the, all the stems and everything in there during the fermentation. You get more um, tannins from the stems and you get a little bit of potassium, so it changes your pH and changes your mouthfeel. And we're just trying to make kind of an interesting component here for a blend of ours. So after we're finished here with the stomping in a minute, we're going to basically take uh, these bins and transfer them to either fermentation bins or uh, one of these beautiful uh, cocho pesto terracotta tanks that we have.
Diamond Mountain Cabernet. What I've got here are we're taking out and some we're leaving in. It's so only the best fruit makes it to the tank. And I'm just a worker. Yeah, and with 13, especially with Sumri and I being able to get on the sorting line for the first time mm -hmm. and being able to physically, at the end, affect every single grape that's going into that final process, it's the culmination of all those walks up and down this hill. And I think you just smile. You just, you have to be happy about it. Otherwise, you couldn't do it because you're farming. Yeah. This is fresh fruit that came in day before yesterday. It, uh, it's still just juice sitting in the bins. The next step will be to take them out of this cold room, let it warm up a little bit, and we'll actually inoculate with yeast. And that yeast will convert the sugar in the grapes into alcohol and carbon dioxide. The CO2 just goes off into the air, be picked up by the plants for next year's wine. The alcohol stays in the wine, and that's one of the reasons why we drink wine. <laughs> red wine made with red grapes has most red grapes have clear juice. If I wanted to make a white wine from Merlot, I would, rather than run it through the crusher uh, and stick it in, this, in a big vat and let it soak on its skins, I would throw it in the press and press that juice away from the skins the same day it was picked. The juice would be gray, clear, lighter than Chardonnay. So uh, Blonde Noir, the sparkling wine, or Champagne, is Pinot Noir, but it's white. From the same grapes that are in this bin, I make a rosé. And you can see that the flesh of the grape is clear. I pick the fruit, goes into a press. It sits for a couple of hours, gets slightly pink. We press it off. That gets fermented without the skins, stays pink, goes to the bottle pink. That same fruit, two to three weeks in this bin, will come out dark red. And this will make a delicious, medium body red wine. So this is Merlot that's been fermenting. It's out in the sunshine to warm up. Um, it was in the cold. I want to get this fermentation going, get it up into the 80 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So out in the sunshine today, beautiful day in, in Napa Valley, and want to get some, get some heat going on. So here we are, berries. The CO2 from the yeast is pushing the berries up, forming a cap. And so they'll come through and push that cap back into the wine, get that color, tannin, flavor out of the skins. And so they come and do that two, maybe three times a day, depending on where you are in the fermentation. There are some wineries that call this method of l'ancienne, the ancient method, which is punch it down by hand. We're almost through fermentation, but it'll keep pushing this cap up for the next, I don't know, four or five days, and we'll wait till it falls in, or till the cap drops, is what we say in the industry. And I'm here to make sure it smells good and see how it tastes along the way. This is a tank of Hidden Ridge Cabernet Sauvignon. It's just started fermentation. It's been in here about six days. It's gonna change the temperature settings. Um, it's pretty cool right now, 68 degrees. It's just getting going. These are set up with an automatic pump overs. Here you see there's a little air pump. Open this valve, the wine runs through, pumps over the top through an irrigator, just like a punch down. Uh, we, we did it by hand in the bins, but with a uh, irrigator device on top. You can get that juice over those dark skins, get the flavor come out. Mm. When you get into like diabetic shock drinking these, are very sweet, very ripe. It's about 25% sugar, a little more than 25% sugar. So it's um, pancake syrup, we call it. And then we'll get going, um, fermenting, turning that um, sugar into alcohol. The thing about the process is when it comes to the winery, well, it doesn't suddenly transmogrify into something else. It just translates into the flavors that are in the wine. So right now I'm getting um, blackberry, there's like a red cassis, a red raspberry, and it's about halfway to being wine. Um, right now, the acidity is a little higher than it will be at the end because the most red wine goes through a malolactic fermentation. It softens the acid, so the acid is a little popped, a little high right now. That will come down, balance out, but its tannins aren't overboard. Flavors are, br are brilliant. You can see this one's quite a bit foamier coming out. The yeast are working away, and the heat of that fermentation is, is taking the color and flavor out of the skins. Is it clean? Is it happy? And this is very happy. There goes 20 bucks. This one's um, done fermenting. It's wine. 
but the wine is still sitting on the grapes and uh, still trying to get more texture, flavor, uh, tannin out of these. Um, it'll probably be here for another week or two based completely on how it tastes. And my view is it's not quite done yet. The next biggest decision after your picking decision is when to press. That's the final step where you say, okay, I've, we've taken everything we can out of the skins. There's no, nowhere else this wine's gonna go that's gonna make it better. And that's when we'll make that pressing decision. Pressing off is all about palate, it's tasting. So once something is on extended maceration, I'm tasting it every other day. Trying to find that balance of tannins and seed tannin and all of it until I feel like it's a complete wine, and that dictates my pressing decision. How hard and how long determine the quality of the juice that comes out of the press? When you're free running it and you're pressing it, I mean, you're just taking it off the side and just... And you're, you're, you're basically, you, you stand at the press and right. you taste the change. Right. And you watch when the flavors change in the juice. But there was a point you say, free run, it's gonna get a little bit richer, a little bit richer, right? stop. Right. Done, 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 because I was getting too tanned. I mean, I was standing there the whole time. That's what our day is, is, is watching the press. We're here today um, pressing off um, a tank of our um, 2013 Cabernet Sauvignon from the estate. This is a basket press, so it's basically a very high-tech replica of an old-school basket press to where these used to be cranked down by hand with a screw press. Um, this is a hydraulic basket press. So you've got a, a motor powering the piston um, that pushes this plate down and, and just squeezes all of the last um, good, uh, good wine out of the skins for us. This process is basically the last step of harvest. The wines have uh, completely fermented, um, so it's no longer grape juice. It's, it's um, rich, unctuous Cabernet. What we do is we drain off all the wine out of the tanks, and then we throw all the grape skins into this basket here and, and press it out. So what I do at this stage is I make sure it smells good and then we taste it. And we typically spit it out because we're, we're doing this all day long. Um, so what we're tasting for is, is the tannins in the mouthfeel and see how this wine is really shaping out because it is so young, but it's important at this stage to, to really pay attention while pressing so you don't press it too hard and over extract some of the, the drying tannins to make sure that you have a nice balanced wine. The free run is pretty soft. It's got a lot of nice kind of rounded tannins, but this press wine just has all the heart and soul. It's got all the mid palette and all the finish. When we're making the Chardonnay, we have uh, both the free run and the light press as one fraction and about 20% as hard press. It's been a separate creature its entire life, from the, from the day of press into its tank into its own so this barrels. Is hard press. Yeah, you want some of the hard press because it has some of these richer qualities to it uh, and a change in, in palette. So we'll look at blending some of this back into our back main in. piece to add more Backbone? Texture, back, exactly. backbone? Absolutely, backbone. And that's when you can really get all of those beautiful just tannin and structure that you're hoping for. And actually it's softness and roundness. It actually ends up being rounder and richer than the more pure mineral-driven free run. It's a pretty s small part of the, uh, of the final blend, but it makes a huge difference. This wine makes me happy. Like, yeah. We'd be happy. We'd be very happy. <laughs> Thank you.
And once we finally made that pricing decision, it's not like we, we go on vacation or we walk away. We barrel it down as quick as we can, and we, we really try to make sure that we protect the wine as much as possible. So uh, I use cooperage as an element of complexity and spice. I am a true believer that the barrel is a vehicle of maturity. By no means do I use it as a vehicle of flavor. It really just depends on the tannin structure and the tannin development that I actually get. That is what's going to be taming your tannin. That's what's going to be bringing your wine into complexity and aging it. So that neutral oak actually tames it down a little bit and allows for that bright fruit to actually show through. For our fruit, oak shouldn't be central. It just supports the fruit. There's an evolution that happens. You bring flavor out of the barrels into the wine. It's been in this barrel now for a couple of months. Um, so within a week, they start to change. Sure. Your wood, your alcohol, your extraction, everything over time as it ages has to go in parallel. And I go back to a vehicle of maturity. When a barrel is brand new, the pores of the barrels are very open, very fresh. For my Howe Mountain wines, they all get 100% new French oak because the tannins can actually hold. And I actually think it softens the seed tannins that come out of the wine. You know, those caramelized sugars are available from the bending of the wood and the bending of the barrel, they're available. But more importantly is that breathing of that virgin wood. Where an older barrel, pores of the barrels have already been sort of clogged with the solids and the tartrates of the wine. So the breathability is a lot less. What I've been working out is really fine tuning, you know, what works best with the fruit of each block. Back to the whole point of being a balance. And so you have that more massive wine, you need more input from all the other characters in the oath. We get to bottling, still preserving all of those magical things that we were able to taste in the vineyards and, and taste in the fermenters and, and translate all of that to that end product. was a absolutely remarkable vintage in that we had really brilliant weather, modest crop loads. It was a very, very dry summer and dry growing season. The beginning of the drought cycle so that the vines were still in balance but, but fighting for, their, for the growth. We love drought conditions. Drought conditions give us small berries, a lot of concentration. The yields were high enough to be commercially viable, but low enough to concentrate flavors for quality. Our yields in the vineyard were, were slightly down, um, which also typically means that the quality is going to be up. And I think we knew early on, just even in tasting the fruit, that 13 was going to be pretty special in terms of intensity and, um, and tannin structure. More definition, more detail, more freshness, more, more, more. And you made a comment to me with 2013 fruit, that that may be the best fruit you've tasted in, I think you chose the term well over a decade back before 2004. Yes. The quality of the fruit in 13 was undeniable.
2013 to us was one of those years that <sighs> neurotic Ronnie didn't have to be calling Tim. What about the rain? What about the this? Because in the early years, <laughs> uh, neurotic's a good word. <laughs> we had perfect weather conditions in that season. We weren't driven by any pressures at the harvest. I mean, even the 11, when the storm came in and lasted for two weeks and, you know, all of the wineries were out here crushing for 24-7 and everybody was fighting over space and it was horrible. So to see 13 come in and kind of let everybody relax. The pace was a perfect pace for winemakers and I think they did an extremely good job of mastering that. All through harvest, I'm watching the weather, saying there's a, there's a huge storm coming <laughs> in seven days. Gonna, the end of harvest will be when that storm comes. But it never came. People were holding their breath because it was just too good to be true. Rain is the enemy at the wrong time, and it just didn't rain. And we just kept pushing it out and pushing it out based on it's getting better, it's tasting better. This Goldilocks here, I, I've heard people call it because it, was, it, was, it wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold. It was perfect. You know, somebody related it to an easy bake oven as a vintage. It's hot at the right time, it's cool at the right time, it rains when it's supposed to, it's dry when it's supposed to, and you can literally pick whenever you want to. It let us make the decision the way we really wanted to make those decisions. And that that's a fairly rare thing, truly. And whenever you're given the chance for the grapes to have a nice, mellow, even ripening season, I believe that you get more balance and more texture, more complexity into the grapes itself. We were able to bring in this beautiful harvest with incredible uh, uniform ripeness. And by being able to let the fruit hang without fear of, of raisining or crop failure, uh, we really were able to let the fruit get as ripe as we needed it to, wanted it to. To have the ability to really call your pick and decide, you know, based on flavor and based on history in this vineyard and based on the end, end goal, I'm going to pick it. You, as the, the vintner winemaker, get to make those decisions as opposed to Mother Nature basically making your decisions for you. And we really were able to say, now, now I want it. It made bad wine in 2013. Look in the mirror. Nobody's fault but your own. The last stage for any wine is its release to the public. So the style of the wines that I make were typically two years in barrel, or just about two years in barrel, and then a year in bottle. They need that time to evolve, to develop. The birthing process takes, it's not so much damaging, it's unsettling to the wine, and that takes another six months to a year to recover from. And so the fall, three years after the wine was first made, is when we release them to the public. We think that's the beginning of when they start to taste good. I've never tasted this reserve, so here, here we go. Oh, yeah. Hope this lives up to all my expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me if it doesn't. No, tell me, tell, tell me if it doesn't. I'd love to hear your, your. Uh... Yeah. Here, here, here. Does that um, complex of mocha I get? Um, sort of like grilled herb. Those mountain herbs, those are things that you just cannot um, copy on valley floors, you know, and they are from chaparral, they are from forests nearby. Wild people sage, all kinds yeah. of things, yeah. People don't understand that the fact that the leaves up on the mountains or pine needles make an impact. Of course, Absolutely. they have to, they go down and become part of the soil too. And so they really have that kind of special touch. And I think that this vineyard really has that impact in so many different ways. There are trees in parts of this vineyard and you can taste it. There's this layers of different kinds of ways to say there's blackberry, cherry, but more layers of herbs. It almost reminds me a little bit of allspice, you know, where you have clove and you have all these different factors that kind of come together as one. As soon as you smell this, you realize there is something distinctive and special going on. There's a smell I'm, I'm looking for. Wow, even, even more stuff going on than the last one. That's a good expression, what yeah. What are you now, a sommelier? <laughs> Just the right amount of earth flavor coming after yeah. it. That's probably the two buck chuck, because that is the one for me. <laughs> It 
was clear to me that we had something that was dramatic and powerful and profound. For Robert Parker, the one thing he loves is complex wines with a lot of muscle. That's a tendency of his. This has all of that. When I made that blend, it was, there really were two pieces that played off each other. And then there were a couple of other elements that added dimension and complexity. I think that appreciation of the mountain really shows in here too. No one can replicate this flavor. And I think that if Parker gave that a lot of credit, I give it the same credit because it is a very, very unique wine. Getting the perfect score puts you in a fairly exclusive club and it's nice to be a member of that club. But I'm not driven by that. How can I say this? The point system, uh, I personally have a problem with it. You know, they're gonna be there, right? People like numbers, they want validation. It's never gonna go away. Love it to go away. Certainly in the marketplace of wine and the selling of wine, it's an important feature. Commercially, it's important. Yeah, I mean, uh, scores sell wine. Scores sell wine. People wanna know that there's a third party arbiter that said that wine is that good. I think wine ratings are a very important tool for, for consumers. Wine scores are an important way to communicate to a large number of people. Scores do help yeah. to sell the wine. Sure. My only point is they don't tell us anything right. about the actual right. wine in the bottle. Hugh Johnson once said, well, what do these people do? Do they score their relatives? Do they score their spouses? Is this how they go about life? Like, how do you measure, you know, something like that? How do you describe your best friend? He might be a great guy. You give him a score, well, my best friend is a 90-point guy. Right. But what does that tell us about him? Not does he have red little. hair? Is he tall? Is right. he skinny? Consumers, I think, expect that because it's a numerical value, that it's an absolute value rather than reflective of the tastes of the reviewer. I do believe that the score and the process is very much about the scorer, and you kind of develop a relationship with those, those people. Because some reviewers have very directed, distinctive preferences, and if you don't like that style of wine, it might be their 100-point wine, right. but it's your 90-point wine at best. Just remember, it's one palette, usually, or maybe a few palettes that are putting a number on a wine, and we're all plumbed a little bit differently, so there's a very relative meaning to that. So I don't take scores very seriously. Everyone's different. Their sense of taste is different. And remember, wine is a living thing. It's so important to remember that it is a living thing. Um, and it really goes through these waves. One day it's going to taste like X. The next day it might be this. The greatest wines in the world, you know, they taste differently. They go through these ups and down swings. And Absolutely. It's just... The fact of the matter is a score can never tell the whole tale of a wine. And that that makes me sad about people who just look at scores. I just wish there was more of a conversation about wine rather than a rating of wine. I'm always impressed when the reviewer is able to put a number and a description together that delivers to me when I taste and I say, okay, I can, I can follow that. And I think those are the type of reviewers that I prefer. Hey, I'm fine with the, with the wine criticism. I say bring it on um, anytime you make any creative output in this world, it will be criticized, and I think we have to, you know, be open to that. It's never gonna go away, and that's okay. You should never live by scores, because you'll die by scores, right? So don't, don't make that your goal. Um, don't let it break you, certainly. As a small little company, we've never been driven by um, the scoring mentality. We have never collectively um, made a wine to pander. No. Never. No. No. And, and if it, we if pander it, to our to our to our buyers, sure. not to our not to the and, wine. And sometimes it aligns. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean happily. Exactly. However, <laughs> we've never we've never we've <coughs> never doctored a wine to you know the the infamous Parker Barrel. Right. No. Never yeah, done. No. The thing that makes you strive for perfection is the work itself, not necessarily the critical claim, a claim that may or may not come. By the way, I do appreciate good scores when they come in. Of course. Of course, I love it. So that probably sounds like, well, he's full of crap. He's, you know, he's contradicting himself. <laughs> this is an exceptional example of the 2013 vintage. Style, class, and character that really exemplifies that vineyard itself. What makes a great vintage is not a single event, it's a massively multivariate event 
that has a single solution, which is the wine that you have in front of you. People need to remember and understand that the amount of things that had to go right for a bottle of wine to deliver the pleasure that it does are pretty remarkable. And that's a winemaker working in tandem with Mother Nature. Every bottle tells the story of the year it came from and the people who made it. And we taste the 2013s and we taste the passion and the signature of these winemakers, you can really find out a lot about, you know, why that brand is so good or why that site is so good. It's because the winemaker was able to capture that in liquid form. It's uh, pretty transparent. You can try to do as much as you can to it, but in the end, you're putting one bottle in front of a person, or one glass even, and it's got to tell them everything they want to know in that one sip. Handing someone, here's what we did together right. this year, I hope you enjoy that. I hope bring bring some pleasure to your life. With the people of our size, it's love in the bottle, and you're hoping that when someone opens a bottle of the wine and looks at it, and it goes from the label to the cork to the top, that they're getting as some piece of pleasure in their life. The best part about being a winemaker is the end user. I mean, there's nothing more fun than being out and you run into someone and they go, dude, are you serious? I love your wines. I want Rubiso wines to be delicious and lovely for people. That's simply what I want. I want them to feel the passion and the love and know that there is that personal touch. You know, it is me, you know, that's out there um, doing the work and, and making sure that, you know, my client's wines are being made to the utmost perfection. I think one of my biggest hopes with the wines that we make is that they kind of taste the passion and really taste all of the effort that we've, we've put into making these wines. Every time someone opens a bottle, I just hope that they can taste how much energy and time and care that we put into it. If anything, wine is meant to be enjoyed with people that you love. And you're just hoping someone's going to open up that bottle, taste it, have a smile on their face, have a good time, want to share it with their friends, which is what this is all about, because wine is social. It is the same thing in France, like in America, Napa Valley, or Italy or even Australia or New Zealand. Everybody meets around a bottle of wine, and the important thing is to share it with people you love. And when the company is good, the wine is always good. Wine, in, in so many ways, is, is the unique generator of conviviality. You're sharing an experience, and it often brings out conversation, and in moderation, a really good time. The most memorable bottles that I've had have been a result of the people I've had it with, the meal I've had with it, or the situation I've been in. There's not a holy grail bottle, the, you know, the sideways bottle where you, it's so precious that you never want to drink it and you end up drinking it alone. That's not the point. That misses the whole point. You know, when you go to a great dinner and it's all about the camaraderie and how great wines, you know, get you into conversations and you, how you tell a story about how you've seen this vineyard and you've been there, it makes people love it that much more. It's part of what the dream of Napa is for many people and the the silent part behind all of that is this, it's family farming. But there's something so irresistibly romantic about vineyards and the allure of the wine and the intoxication of it and the transformation you go through when you drink a glass of good wine as opposed to bad wine. And when someone sends you a note about it even or writes something, it's just amazing. Uh, it makes you do this. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, we, we really... And it pushes you to through the next winter into the next year <laughs> to start all over again. I think my dream always is that people have an emotional response to, to the wines that we make. A smile, a happiness, a look, and then you know you've done it. You know that you've affected someone's time. Yeah. On, on, on this earth. Just like I experienced in the first few wines that made me really think this is more than a beverage, I want people to go to stop and go, oh my God, the aesthetics of this are so moving, um, just like a painting would move them or a piece of music. So I, I want people to have an emotional response. I've said that, I think, before. Like, I want to make people weep. What I want people to, to have is a a sense that these things were crafted with care. We put all of our heart and soul and personality into these bottles. Each wine is unique to the client. 
And yet at the same time, you can tell the fingerprints of the winemaking team through it. Drinking some of the 13s now, they're just babies, but they're incredible. And you just know that they're going to keep going for, for years. They're evolving beautifully. And they're really starting, just starting to sing right now. I think they're starting to open up and be approachable. But I love 13. Love, love, love. We're going to make some friends with them. Um, they were what we expected. We were very optimistic about 12. Um, great fruit quality, wonderful definition, excellent wine. You know, best of all worlds. Big and beautiful. How could 13 be better? It was. 13 was perhaps the best vintage that I've had a chance to yeah. make wine in. A decade. Yeah. Decade, definitely. Yeah. The nicest vintage since 2004, the year we started together. It was a great vintage. If you were a winemaker in Napa Valley in 2013 and you made anything less than an outstanding wine, you need, you need a different line of work because it was just that easy. The season was, uh, you know, perfect. An absolutely dynamic vintage that we will look back on and I can't wait to taste 2013 vintage wines 20 years from now. They're agers, they're 20 year. You know, put them down in a cellar for 20, 25 years and they're, they're gonna be gorgeous. In my 12 vintages that I've done, 13 is the one that stood out, um, where the, the stars kind of lined up. It's the definition, the detail, and the, uh, the little things that make a great vintage and 13 had all of it. 2013, I think, will be seen as a classic vintage because it has the power and the texture to age for decades. Here's to a great 13 vintage. Well, that is the 13 vintage in a nutshell, except in liquid form. <laughs> exactly. to the wine angel up there. He has bestowed something nice on us. You've helped us to be better, Tim. I, I, look, at, I look at the history of And so I'm gonna hug you. And I just wanna thank you. You made a big, big difference in us. Thank you, George. I, it's um, it's uh, been a pleasure. And cheers. some custom crush. I've got my own tanks in their space, and I'm just, we're at the very beginning of a fermentation, and I'm making sure the temperature settings are where I want them. It's a classic Cabernet, and there's no juice coming out of that tank. That's awesome. It's because it's empty. <laughs> <laughs> Expert winemaker doing his thing. <laughs> it takes a long time to be this good at this. <laughs> or just put it in your glass and do that. And if you're in Australia, I think you do this. Go the other way. Go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Alfred Hitchcock oh. moment. <laughs> <laughs> He's running over. You're nice. <laughs> the outtakes, part of, part of the reel. Yeah. Yeah. Ready? And cut. <laughs> I noticed you're drinking something. Timothy? Gin and tonic. Gin and tonic. <laughs> gin and tonic. <laughs> so you're a winemaker and you're drinking gin and tonic. 
you know, uh, there, are, there are days when, when wine tastes like work. It's an old saying in, in Napa, it takes a lot of, or a lot of, in wine country, it takes a lot of beer to make wine. Um, can't drink beer, so uh, gin and tonic. Well, this is fun, these are yeah. great wines, Tim. Good job, oh, always. Tim, thank you. I can sense a beer coming on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have beer in the fridge. Nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> We don't yeah, fill them for you back in right. the <laughs> Nothing pathogenic grows in wine. Yeah, that's what I've been telling you. In fact, viruses and all that break down in wine. They can't, but they dissolve. So what you're saying is that it's good to keep good health just to drink a lot of wine? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> having enough sunshine, having a small crop are central to, to building a wine that that has the power to age and power for, and texture. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Cheers, you guys. Cheers. Cheers, Dolly. Cheers. Cheers. Huh? Cheers. Thank you.